Professor Pelinka, I would uh, join all the uh, my predecessors and thanking you very much for your very interesting and instructive presentation. I have two two very uh, small comments and two questions. You mentioned uh, uh, two episodes, so-called episodes, by Haider when he referred to the Nazi past. And if I'm not mistaken, he also called in the Austrian parliament <coughs> the extermination camps as labor camps. And penal camps. Penal. Penal camps. Penal camps. Penal camps. And, and, uh, and this was, this rose, I think, a very uh, strong reaction. About uh, Kreisky, uh, I think that uh, he granted recognition to Arafat before he asked Arafat to abandon the Palestinian Covenant. And this, I think, was a very important, important turn in giving that recognition to the PLO and Arafat. Now, uh, two questions about what is the, um, of course, you, you mentioned that how to, the educational field. And we know that you can combat anti-Semitism by two, two means, <coughs> educational means and by the legal means. The, my question is what is in the legal field also with the subject of Holocaust. Uh, referring to the educational aspect, uh, I, the question is how well are the <coughs> teachers, particular teachers of history, trained in order to present this subject? My question is how would they explain the fact that the Holocaust uh, took place in, in countries like Germany and Austria that were very highly cultured uh, nations and, the, and they, they went to Mauthausen, they went to others and uh, it was also in the presence of the uh, director of the uh, educational department of the municipality. Thank you very much. Uh, and last one in this round, a fly. Fly. and eventually understanding that they were part of the problem. Uh, but uh, as a result of that, there's been a lot of progress in several areas, several practical issues that relate to the Holocaust, such as in education, in commemoration, and in uh, restitution. But there's one issue. Has this been the case? Is it because recent justice ministers have been from the Freedom Party, or you have some other you know, uh, response or reaction to that? Without higher education. So it's not the recipe to get rid of anti Semitism, but it helps step by step. And this is, of course, a very long process we have to face, and at the end, there will be not no anti Semitism, but lesser anti Semitism. That's all we can hope for, realistically. This is also a crime, and it is sometimes punished by Austrian courts. So hardcore right-wing Nazi attitudes are now quite successfully fought. And I think this is not the real problem. The problem is the soft version of anti-Semitism. It's not the case that someone says, and this is a much more important aspect, because this can decide elections, and this makes politicians think of votes and this has a strong social impact and this is much more a problem for the socialist minister of justice Christian Broder who himself was of a high credibility because he was a resistance fighter he was um, clearly anti nazi but his argument and this is still very much dominating the Austrian um, uh, judicial system and, and um, uh, you don't have to forget that uh, soon after 1945 almost all Nazi judges were re established in the Austrian court system so of course this generation is not active anymore and mostly not alive but nevertheless 
So it was a tradition, let him die. And if we just put it on the long bench of the lange Bankschieben, we don't say we don't do anything again. Well, let's just wait and see, and soon he will be dead, and then it's over. I think so why is, is there no public opinion against this, for example? Why is there no local lobby to, to fight this? This is... Kulpati in Croatia. So it's not a question of his chronological age. A fully agree with you. On a certain level, he's a perfect case for Austria to deal with because he's Croatian. Yeah. The Croatians asked for his extradition. He lost his Austrian citizenship because he applied for Croatian citizenship. And there's no reason on earth to protect him. <laughs> and Austria can gain points by getting rid of him. But even him they won't get rid of. Yes, I agree. Well, at least Heider, as governor of Carinthia, is economically strongly linked to Croatia, by the way. It's a federal issue. Well, it's, a, it's a federal issue. Yet he lost his Austrian citizenship. Okay, so, well, so we're not going to have a dialogue. We have to do the third round. Thank you. <laughs> third and last oh, round, Ambassador Tolino, Chaim Assis, Ambassador Rafati. I just wanted to ask you, you want to go one for thing. Thing. Yeah. It, 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 was extreme, it was extremely interesting for me as an ex-Austrian uh, to listen uh, to your lecture. But tell me one thing, in the, uh, isn't couldn't an institution, by the way, uh, the party of Mr. Heider, the people of the party of Mr. Heider in the parliament voted for the restitution. Uh, Mr. Heider was never a minister in this government. He was always governor of Carinthia. And from 27% in the elections, they came in the last elections to 8 and 9% by its behavior. Um, just Ambassador Gobrin told us the case. I can tell you that I was invited as ambassador to give a lecture on anti-Semitism and Holocaust to 200 teachers of history in Austria from first uh, grades to the person from the 60,000 Jews uh, massacred in the Holocaust in Austrian Jews, learned about him, about his family, made contact with his family if they were still alive, <laughs> and wrote a letter to this person, Atism, even when it's declining, even when it's, it's, we like to be persecuted, you know, all the time. So I think that Austria is, of course, there is anti-Semitism in Austria, but since 45 until today, and with this government of Mr. Schiesel, with the party of Haider in it, I think that Austria today is one of the most friendly countries. Profile. He said, yes, there is anti-Semitism, but we deal with it. And maybe the explanation why there is no lobby, because the Jewish community there doesn't want to do, uh, maybe this, uh, doesn't want to encourage this lobby. You didn't answer also the question of Mr. Hakimian. I, I was surprised to find a large, we don't know enough about this there community. There was a manifest by this new musical in all the papers to invite the Jews from all over the world to come to Austria. It, it's amazing. I think that the Jewish community, I think that the Jewish community is very active in this field in trying to combat anti-Semitism. But Professor Berlinka is more eligible to answer that question. And the Jews came back. Now, what might is a little bit naive. First, of course, because uh, what happened uh, in Austria beginning with 1938 was not not only exiling the Jews, but of course much, much more. And secondly. The Austrians did not ask the surviving Jews back in 1945. Now to Ambassador Toledo, I agree with respect to Austria's relations with Israel and not so much in agreement with respect to anti-Semitism at all. I think really the Austrian government and the German government are probably the most pro-Israeli government within the European Union major essay on this subject on the website of the Jerusalem Center uh, very soon. It's a question of, I think, a week or so. Uh, well, since uh, this is the topic of today, uh, it concerns an issue which in the bare broader framework of, if you don't mention his name among uh, specifically with the question of well over half of the population. Today, this shouldn't really surprise, uh, surprise us uh, in a study which hasn't been much published in uh, German, uh, a German big 
Paul down by the University of Bielefeld. Uh, then we have the 16th of January. It's difficult to memorize all this. We have the second uh, symposium on Israeli uh, European relations. Then uh, we have on the 24th the next anti Semitism lecture by Ed Beck, who was born in Timisoara in Romania in 48. He emigrated to the United States in 1960. Most of his teenage years he has spent in Vienna. He returned to New York in 67. Columbia, we had to attend Columbia, where he got his five degrees. He is uh, the Karl Deutsch Collegiate Professor of Comparative Politics and German Studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The lecture is a new, or perhaps revived, Unhib inhibitedness by Jews in Germany. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you, Manfred, very much. It was great to be here in um, last time in, in, in May, which is the only um, part actually that is not really that much original research, but. Uh, one cannot look at anti-Americanism without looking at anti-Semitism. Um, I'm here at, at the moment, actually, in Jerusalem, teaching uh, in the uh, an intensive course in the Institute for European Studies. For um, there has been sort of in the post-Holocaust era until certainly 1990 or 91, um, a very clear compact or a very clear understanding, a very clear form of um, collective culture, which basically made anti-Semitism. In, in fact, I argue, maybe not so much today, because uh, we will concentrate on the German situation on it just itself and give lots of examples, but I see this lowering of the threshold very, very much linked to precisely America and anti-Americanism and Israel. Meaning that the lowering has to have a very strong um, discourse of, again, protecting the weak, which again, on the whole, I find <coughs> uh, not only acceptable, but commendable. What I don't find acceptable is that Jews are their institutions are fostered and protected by the authorities. Uh, there are more synagogues probably than Jews, <laughs> and it's not the joke, but it's really, um, there are lots of empty synagogues uh, that are built, rebuilt. Um, there exists a sort of Jewish chic even, I would say, among non-Jewish non Germans that manifests itself. Um, and what I will focus on is certain examples. I will not focus on the increase in anti-Semitic acts, in other words, of violence or of desecrations. Or